This week on the Virtual Skeptics, technical problems galore. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob Google. Bob goes clear. Yes. Thanks, Google. Bob goes clear. Eve tells headline writers all that sloshes is not Atlantis. Sharon finds Bigfoot in the classroom, and Tim is not. Boy, wow, I'm just glad close this is a <laughs> Got a surprise of broadcasting right now. Google has been uh, rolling out some kind of software update today, and it's really been wreaking havoc with this. If you haven't noticed, uh, this is live. Clearly live. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, it's dead. Yeah. It's Let me introduce our panel. We got a we got a panel chance this week. Let's see. First off, we've got Bob Laskowitz. Let's see, he's highest conspiracy guy, web columnist, blogger for Skeptical Humanities, and Swift blog contributor. Eve Siebert, editor and blogger at Skeptical Humanities, and contributor to Skepticality. Sharon Hill, editor of Doubtful News, and author of the CSI's Sound Sciency web column, and special guest this week instead of Tim Farley, who is doing work in quotes. We welcome our special guest, Ben Radford, Research Fellow at the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, Managing Editor of Skeptical Inquiry Magazine, Investigator, Chupacabra Slayer, Columnist for Discovery News, Monster Talk co-host, author or and co-author of six books, and <laughs> lots of other stuff. We'd be here all, all night. I know, jeez. Ben's bio. So, like I said, He's this the is robot live. we're talking about, right? What? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> so, like I said, this is live. If you haven't noticed, uh, we are broadcasting on Google Plus Hangouts on air. Uh, if you post a question in the YouTube comments or on Twitter with hashtag Virtual Skeptics, we'll do our best to work it into the show. But first, we need an update on this week in the virtual uh, no in uh, robot apocalypse thing. That's the thing we're doing, right? It's the real actual apocalypse. Yeah, the the real actual apocalypse. I'm playing a video. Uh, this is a a teaser video of something called the Maker Shaker, and it is really cool. It makes and shakes drinks. Uh, this has currently gone, been revealed to today at Google I/O. The big conference is going on. What reason why they're rolling out software today? Uh, a cooperation between MIT Sensible uh, Sensible City Lab and Coca Cola and Bacardi Rum. Uh, it is set up to use three of uh, these large industrial KUKA robots to make drinks on demand using a, uh, an app on your phone. So you can download the app and order your drinks. You can see how many people are in line in front of you, and uh, they will shake it up and deliver it on this little conveyor belt. Now, the, the uh, arms themselves are programmed to follow the patterns of, that were done by an Italian dancer called Roberto, Roberto Bole, someone I don't know because obviously I'm not cultured enough, um, and choreographed by uh, another guy. <laughs> Nobody's going to know anyway. No. Um, <laughs> it's done as a social experiment, and it's at the Google I.O. Let me get a picture of this. This is a nice static picture. It's really sexy, and it's uh, yet another example of how we're enslaving robots and also uh, teaching them skills to um, to eventually kill us. I want to yeah. open a club now. Yeah. Yay. I have that as well, Wouldn't that be awesome? Bartender. Yes! That'd be it, wild. There are tons of pictures of this online today. Uh, people are tweeting about it. Um, I think there's a hashtag, Maker Shaker, or Google I.O. Um, are they but, demoing uh, it at the at the conference? Yes, you can actually. It's like uh, it's in the big one of the big atriums. You can just walk in and order your drinks ahead of time on your app, and they uh, the, the app will tell you when it's ready. It comes out on a little conveyor belt that's in front. It's like lights. It's a big scoreboard that shows statistics on what drinks they're making and stuff. It's really cool. And it has its own that. choreographer. Yes. Yeah, you can do yes. that. It's, it's own stunt double too. How's that? Do work? we have to tip it? I, I don't know if, if it you want to stave off the apocalypse, tip. yeah. <laughs> but yes, anything you can do to get on the robot's good side is a good thing. Absolutely. Just saying. Because if it can shake your drink, it could kill you. That's a just, general Just premise. saying. That's that is true. the worst Turing test ever. <laughs> <laughs> no. It, um, it reminds so. me of Kurt Vonnegut's uh, Player Piano. Um, there's the, uh, a scene, it was his first novel, and he was basically writing about what it was like to work for, I think it was General Electric, 
Um, but he was in, envisioning life maybe 10 years down the road when automation had taken over and player piano, um, you know, all of the, the skilled workers, their moves were programmed into the computer and they were doing all the work in the factory um, uh, like a player piano. Um, so like the way player pianos do all the work in a factory? Ex ex exactly. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, if I were teaching a class on Vonnegut right now, I'd totally be all over that. But awesome, yeah. What, what, what was the uh, what was that the automatic the automatic chess machine the Turkish Turkish nun or something? What was that? You guys know uh, what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's like Vaguely, is it the automatic yeah. Turk or something? It was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was yeah. The, Turk. the mechanical Turk, I think it was. Yeah. Well, there was a reference in the uh, the um, Terminator TV series to the Turk, which was based off of that. It was a actually modern computer that was supposed to be the, the source of all the AI that killed everybody. And, and I digress. A, a, a reference in uh, last week's Doctor Who to the mechanical Turk, a little guy sitting inside a chess game. Oh, yeah. See? Nicely, nicely played. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, since you're talking... And I yeah. know that you're going to talk about Scientology, and we all love your stories on Scientology. Oh, Scientology is a hell of a thing. Actually, Scientology this week is just an excuse to talk about something interesting. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so Scientology, they managed to turn what should have been a simple public event, well, actually kind of closed event, into a shameful failure of epic proportions in the way only they can. Um, it turns out... Wait, Korea? Yeah. Is it Scientology or North Korea? Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, Ben, it, it, did you see the episode where we played? Is it North Korea or Scientology? <laughs> I did not see that. So which no. which? Okay. Oh yeah. Which one bombed Mexico? <laughs> oh man, that's a tough one. <laughs> I'm guessing Scientology. Yes, L. Ron Hubbard during the Second World War opened fire on an, a Mexican island. That sounds yep. that sounds par for the course. Yeah, yeah, he was way out there. I think he thought it was a submarine or something. Yeah, but it was a, a foreign sovereign nation. Okay. So yeah. So David wow. Miscavige, uh, the cult leader, uh, was in Portland, Oregon, to open uh, what is known as an ideal org, or uh, a big org building. Um, by all accounts, uh, Scientology is internally divided. Um, there have been a number of high-level defections in the last few years. The numbers seem to be down, and as the pay-to-play debacle in the Atlantic in February showed, the group can't buy good press coverage. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, mm -hmm. Ms. Cavage has been opening a lot of these buildings all over the world uh, in the last few years. And it, it's hard to understand his rationale for this, actually, since there are regular orgs in these towns, the local chapters, and they're not, you know, the, their facilities aren't being used to capacity. Um, there's a fairly good argument that these renovations or openings are, are more of a public relations spectacle financed by local Scientologists who are, have been encouraged to, for instance, take out mortgages and max out their credit cards to finance these buildings. So uh, this week, Scientology uh, took out a movie filming permit in the area around uh, the opening of their new ideal org in Portland uh, that restricted access uh, to the blocks around the event. Uh, of course, businesses were still open, and one of uh, Tony Ortega, do you guys know who he is? Mm -hmm. uh, he's been writing uh, for The Village Voice. I don't think he's there anymore, but no, he's he been covering. No, he has blog. Yeah. He doesn't make tacos? No. There are other Ortegas. Oh. Yeah. That that's, um, that's what sorry, they want you to think. <laughs> it's sorry. all the same Ortega. I'll, I'll um, yeah, now. so one He's of his... very, very busy man. He is. Um, tacos in the morning, Scientology in the evening. Uh, so one of his correspondents got permission to film the ceremony uh, from an adjacent store uh, right across, uh, like this beautiful shot down, beautiful view of the of the stage area, and I don't know what happened if he like tweeted a picture of the of where he was going to be, but the next day he came back, um, and the store denied him entry. Um, they denied him his perch. Uh, he was patted down by police. It sounds like the the Scientologist got to the guy. Um, he was patted down by uh, police. So he then got permission to film from a nearby bar, 
But when he got to the bar, he was told that the space had been rented out by Scientology and that he was not, inv not invited. Lastly, uh, he ended up in a public area of a apartment complex, and they tried to get him kicked out of there too. And someone said that the, the Scientology representatives got entry by saying they were police. Um, but you can see the, the, the view that he got. Um, since he was the invited guest of a resident, he was allowed to stay. Um, and as you can see, he he got a pretty good view. You can uh, uh, of the of the scene. Now, the important thing I want you guys to remember is to look at this line of trees right here. Um, though you can't see, mm -hmm. it, but it, it, I can see know, it. Cutting off. You got it. it. Those were those yeah, little it's rental like shrubs trees. right across the road. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, those are rental trees that are you know they're put up to be a screen. Um, uh, so. Um, this harassment is par for the course for Scientology. Uh, they are renowned for harassing critics mercilessly. I think most famously in the case of John Sweeney, uh, the BBC reporter, who yeah. lost it, um, but was completely justified in doing so. Um, so nobody's surprised. However, something odd happened in the church's coverage of the throne event. In the photo on their website, check it out, could bring that up. Yep. It's up. It's up. What is missing? Well, that, that row of trees is gone. And it's been replaced with people. Lots of people who weren't really there. <laughs> and confetti and shit. Um, yeah. Where did the confetti <laughs> come from? Yeah, I know. Where did the confetti come from? Um, so yeah, I thought it were butterflies or something. Like, what the hell's going on there? It's like some sort of migration, or, or I thought it was like <laughs> ghosts of the trees. Yeah, it just is very odd. So, um, what we're looking at uh, is an inexplicably bigger crowd, um, one that's more excited, and the trees are gone, and the crowd goes around the block. Um, clearly, someone had a little bit of crowd envy. Um, and, a sixth, and a sixth grade niece with Photoshop on her computer. Um, or maybe they had to justify the, the 2,500 attendees that they put on their website. And instead of revising the number down by two thirds, uh, decided, oh, we'll just you know fix the visual record. Um, and so this apparently is not the only time it's happened. Uh, it's not the first time that visual history has been revised. And actually, um, I'm like I said, I'm using Scientology as an angle into something a little bit more mm, interesting and important, um, but also fun. Um, we've spoken about the similarities between Elron and the Kims of North Korea, but this photo manipulation, while it's not unheard of in North Korea, I think, Sharon, you'll remember the massively copied and paste hovercraft invasion force. Love that one. From mm -hmm. a few months ago, yeah. Um, <laughs> the true pioneer in this area was Joseph Stalin, who makes Kim Jong-il just look like some weird-ass dude who loves water slides. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in Orwell's 1984, Winston Smith, the protagonist, works for the Ministry of, Tr of, of Information, or uh, Ministry of Truth, the Mini-True, where he corrects historical documents so that they line up with the political truth of the day. And this was something that was already happening in Stalin's Russia in 1948. Um, when the novel was published. So several years ago, a guy named David King published a magnificent and chilling book about Stalin's revision of history in The Commissar Vanish Vanishes, falsification of photographs and art in Stalin's Russia. When someone fell out of favor with the regime um, and was disappeared or done away with, Russia as a whole would collectively go through its history and make the person unbe. Um, Bookstore owners would pull the books of their uh, of these people from the shelves, or if the people, you know, if their photos appeared in the books, would scratch out their faces. Um, so let's take a look at this first picture, first example of this. Um, this is a picture of Moscow, Lenin in Moscow in 1920, and you can see if you look to the to the right, um, you see that there are two guys standing there. One of them, I believe, is Trotsky. Now Trotsky was the ideological. Uh, rival of Stalin um, and potential heir and that wasn't going to last. He was actually murdered in Mexico in exile. Um, but when you look at what happened in to, to, to once he was killed, check this out. 
the next one. Okay, there we go. Ooh. Yeah, they're gone. It changed color. And it changed color. <laughs> hmm. um, so Photoshop. he made... Yeah, it, can you like this is what I want like can you imagine how messed up the historical record would be if Stalin had Photoshop? So um, let's look at a, a, another one that 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 is um, uh, more in line with the Scientology one. Now this is a picture. This is not a bad crowd for Lenin. You can see him. He's the one who's who's uh, speaking, little bald guy, um, and it's not a it's not an awful crowd. But you know, Stalin wanted to wear the mantle of a really great man, so uh, he had people. And go to this, the next one. All right, so he took the crowd from the bottom picture. See the the banner there, mm -hmm. and then copied and pasted that into this 1920 shot of uh, Lenin in St. Petersburg. Wow. Um, so, pointing at your screen doesn't actually work. That's true. It doesn't. <laughs> that one there. That one there. Everybody look at that one. But and then, yeah, okay, fine. I'm I'm in teacher mode, so I'm pointing at the it's, screen. It's not a smart board. Uh, yes, I know. It's not a smart teacher. So, <laughs> all right. Wow. So it all fits. Yeah. And the, let's take a look at the last series of portraits. One that's really kind of creepy. So this is a a, a photo of four principals: uh, and uh, Nikolai uh, Antipov, Stalin, Sergei Kirov, and Nikolai Shvernik uh, in Leningrad in 1926. Now, Antipov was the last leading Stalinist to be shot. He was killed in in 1941 um, as the the Nazis threatened to capture Moscow, and this gave you this image. Wow, right? so this guy looks like a drawing. They crop, yeah, yeah, that's kind of funny. The, the pictures become more drawing-like as time goes on and much more soft focus. It's really kind of funny. If you look at pictures of Stalin, he seems to get younger, which is amazing. Um, so uh, uh, Shvernik at the far right was the next to disappear from the portrait. But in reality, he actually survived the regime. So it looks like somebody was a little overzealous with being politically correct. If you could bring that up. Boink. And he's gone. Uh, Kirov was also wiped from history. Uh, his assassination was the pretext for great purges. So one of the things in the show trials that they'd say was, well, he was complicit in the uh, uh, the Kirov assassination. Um, and that left us with just one guy, Joseph Stalin. But in what I can say is a remarkable coincidence, a very happy research coup that I was able to pull off, I was able to find out who was behind the greatest political purges that this planet has ever seen. Would you bring it up? <laughs> Evil Bert. <laughs> J'accuse, Evil Bert. <laughs> he looks very menacing there, I have to say. Yes, does, he looks that evil. is the very menacing oh, Bert. Yeah. God. yeah. You want to know what happened to Cookie Monster? Ernie must, Ernie must He's in, in the gulag. <laughs> No so. cookies for you. Yeah. No, cookies for you. <laughs> no cookies for you. So yeah, that's what I got. I have. I have to commend you on being able to work both Scientology and North Korea into an article that wasn't about either. Isn't Bert. that awesome? That is pretty awesome. And Bert. And Bert. Evil Bert. And Bert. I think that meme's gonna take off. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you think it's gonna like good Bert? Bet. Yeah. Yes. Well, let me let me throw something out there, uh, which is I uh, you're seeing seeing the this evil bird staring at me in, in a very creepy way. <laughs> um, I a few a few months ago, uh, I at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, there's a really really good exhibit called "Faking It: Manipulated Photography Before yep. Photoshop." Uh, if you haven't seen it, if you're if you're in New York, go check it out. It's an amazing uh, it's amazing piece. Again, it's called "Faking It." It's it's at the, it's at the is Met. it a permanent exhi exhibit? Uh, I think I think it is. Um, no, uh, it's October 11th through January 27th. So I don't know where the hell it is now, but it's bouncing around. Mm. Um, but it's uh, if people can get a chance again, it's it's fascinating. And it covers a lot of the you know the Stalin purges, um, as well as artistic artistic faking. 
Um, and it's for people who are interested in, in fake photography, because oftentimes, you know, someone will, will, will show me a, a photograph that, you know, that occurred, you know, before like 1980. They're like, it could have been faked. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, they, they didn't have Photoshop back then. Like, well, they didn't have digital editing when they made Star Wars. So, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Star Wars is a documentary, of course. So. Yes, it is. Well, yeah, yeah. Clearly. And on that note, yeah. Uh, you've got a story on Atlantis, you know, another historical yep. story. Yep, sort of. Um, so, yeah, two news stories this week, at least, cheerfully use the word Atlantis to describe things that have nothing to do with Atlantis. To be fair, in both cases, the word Atlantis was in quotation marks, and neither, neither article actually argued that Plato's Atlantis had been found, well, at least not quite. Still, it's depressing that headline writers don't think that geological and archaeological discoveries are interesting enough to stand on their own without actually referring to some crap that doesn't exist. So Atlantis number one, Japanese and Brazilian geologists dredged up a hunk of granite from the seabed off the coast of Brazil. We have a picture of that. Uh, Roberto Ventura Santos, geology director of the Geology Service of Brazil, explains that it is unusual to find granite on the seabed, uh, and the granite could be evidence of a continent that disappeared after Africa and South America split. Now, Santos does actually refer to the continent as, quote, unquote, Brazil's Atlantis, but he also clearly says that we speak of Atlantis in terms of symbolism. Obviously, we don't expect to find a lost city in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, however, that kind of <laughs> rationality didn't stop the Telegraph's Donna Bowater from beginning her article by suggesting that that's exactly what they found. Uh, the legend of Atlantis, a sunken island thought to have once lain between Africa and South America, has been the subject of literary myths for centuries. But geologists in Brazil have now added their claims to speculation over the precise location of the mysterious landmass, mm. mentioned first by Plato in around 360 BC. Yeah, no. Um, of mm. course, the rock is just perhaps a teeny tiny bit older than Plato's Atlantis. Uh, it's like a hundred million years old. Um, and it has nothing to do with Atlantis. There is no civilization, advanced or otherwise living on it, not even a civilization of mer people, as far as I can tell. But it it's looks really not, cool. Yeah. It's I can not see it. I'm pointing to it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right, right there. Right, 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 this is the neat part right here, you guys. you got to take a yeah. look at this right there. Where is it? Is it right there? Is it right there? Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Okay, yep, that's it. So it's not Atlantis. It's an old rock. Atlantis number two is in England. Live Science ran a story called Amazing Lost Atlantis Survives Beneath English Sea about Dunwich in Suffolk. Dunwich was once a thriving medieval town that was gradually claimed by the sea beginning in the 13th century, leaving behind only a small village. Since it was founded during the Anglo-Saxon or possibly Roman period at the very earliest, obviously no one thinks Dunwich was act actually Atlantis, but for some reason, it's necessary to call it England's Atlantis or Britain's Atlantis. Even the website dunnage.org.uk is subtitled The Search for Britain's Atlantis. Do we all have to have our own Atlantis? Yeah, Apparently I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Lake yeah. Masters. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So <sighs> despite the fact that it's obviously not Atlantis, I find it interesting anyway. So I'm going to tell you a little about it. Yeah, this is, we're going to do whatever the hell we feel like day on Pretty Virtual much. Skeptics. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. It's yeah. Yeah. only today? Yeah. yeah, there's that. And she's going to end with Bert. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, she does it. Floating. Um, Dunwich is sometimes associated with Dummock, the see of the first bishopric of East Anglia, established by King Siebert, also known as Saint Siebert who was either the son or a stepson of Radwald, the dude who was buried in the royal ship burial at Sutton Hoo, probably. Siebert is also essentially the same name as my last name, 
which means obviously he's the best king and best saint. Ever. <laughs> it means bright victory, or victory bright. Yes. Whatever. <laughs> yes, it does. It, in, Grammar. In, 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 it matters. <laughs> During the Norman period, Dunwich was a, a seat of wealth and both commercial and ecclesiastical power. It gained its standing from its harbor. Unfortunately, the sea fought back. Up until the late 13th century, Dunwich had as many as 18 ecclesiastical buildings. It now has two, or bits of two. The rest are in the sea. The Dunwich website includes a series of prints and photographs of All Saints Church from 1736, shortly before it was abandoned, up to 1930, and I believe we have a slide of that. Oh, After everything it. but a buttress had fallen into the sea, and actually the buttress has, has, was saved, it would have fallen into the sea as well. The reclamation by the sea only took a few decades, but the building had fallen into ruin before that. One of the last gravestones at the site fell into the sea in the 1990s. As of 2011, one remained. In 1286, a large, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a large storm swept many buildings out to sea. In 1287, two more storms, the South England Flood and St. Lucia's Flood, did more damage. The harbor was destroyed by a storm in 1328, and more buildings were destroyed by a storm in 1347. Since then, more and more of the town has been claimed. Destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And on an episode of Time Team, which features Baldrick from Blackadder, it was estimated oh, that... Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Blackadder fan, sorry. Yeah. It was estimated that what remains will be gone in another 100 years. That episode, by the way, manages not to mention Atlantis in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. The Live Science article concerns a report from the University of Southampton's underwater survey of the town. The report, which doesn't mention Atlantis, is fascinating, as are the images from the survey, some of which can be seen in a Live Science slideshow called England's Atlantis, Images of a Lost Medieval Town. Even more infuriating than the name is the last slide, an image of Atlantis from Athanasius Kircher's 1669 map, and we have a picture of that. Uh, Live Science's blurb then is titled, The Real Atlantis. Mm -hmm. The blurb reads, Atlantis is a legendary lost island subcontinent, often idealized as an advanced utopian society holding wisdom that could bring world peace. The idea of Atlantis has captivated dreamers, occultists, and new agers for generations. Dunwich isn't mentioned. It has nothing to do with Dunwich. But the juxtaposition makes it sound as if maybe Dunwich really is Atlantis. Well, Good job, to, live science. To be fair, yes. Atlantis did disappear gradually over centuries. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, admittedly, the University of Southampton's own press release, press release mentions Atlantis, though, as I said, the actual report does not. Kudos to The Guardian for managing to report on the story without mentioning Atlantis. BBC, not so good. <laughs> several, uh, several churches were discovered in the survey. One that existed and whose location is known, but which wasn't detected by the survey, is the Church of St. Mary, a Knights Templar preceptory. It was taken over by the Knights ho Hospitallers after the Templars were suppressed. And then the building was destroyed in 1562 after the dissolution. And the foundations then washed out to sea in the reign of Charles I. No news on whether the survey discovered the Holy Grail or proof that Jesus was Mary Magdalene's baby daddy. <laughs> so anyway, keep, keep I, <laughs> I'd like to end by just looking at some pretty pictures that are not of Atlantis. First, we have St. Peter's Church. That's oh. a slide of it. What is this? Underwater. And then we oh. have some mortar bricks from white, what might be the chapel of St. Catherine's Church. And it's all very fascinating and nifty without in any way, shape, or form being Atlantis. Yay. There you go. Well, I, I, I have to say, I, I, I've, um, 
I've written for life science, and I, I write for life science, and I actually done a pretty good, uh, what I was told is a pretty good piece on Atlantis for life science, and I'm curious, I, have, I haven't actually seen it, I wonder whether they, they linked to my piece, or whether the editors there saw this and they're like, if we link to Ben's piece, then this is going to basically undercut everything here, so we're just going to like pretend it is not there. I did you know. not see a link to your piece. Yeah, but she does yeah. like to throw bombs like that, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. I think Atlantis is one of those those words that just draw people in. Yeah, they're just going to use them, and it's become like chupacabra. Yeah. <laughs> the or the yeah. yeah, the anything catch all word for something weird. Well, and and it would be it, it wouldn't be so bad except for then the the weird little attempts to. Suggest that maybe it actually was Atlantis. Right, right. Even though the rest of the article clearly says, well, no, it's not. But what was annoying to me was that the scientists in the first story actually used the word Atlantis, the yeah. Brazilian Atlantis. And as I as I wrote in Daphne right. News, this this is going to get people confused, just like the whole mm -hmm. God particle thing did. Yeah, they yep. completely misconstrued the meaning. So don't do that. Yeah. Oh, Although, again, he does say, we use it symbolically. Yeah, well, that's lost. <laughs> yeah. A little caveat there at the end. Well, do you guys, do you, do you guys know uh, what, the, what the update is on that Baltic Millennium Falcon UFO? Remember no, that story? I have heard nothing. Yeah, I remember that, but no. Because, yeah, because they, they, they found this, this big giant something or other, and some people were thinking it was a, <laughs> a UFO. It looked like the Millennium Falcon. Um, and and they, I thought it they was sent a out Raptor actually. A what? A Cylon Raptor. Well, that well that was that was like that, that's the possibility. Yeah. I mean, it, it don't be ridiculous, Brian. Their mind than always Brian. goes to the robots. I'm sorry. Everyone knew it was the the plug at the bottom of the tub that you pull to drain the ocean. Yeah. That's right. That's right. The plug to hell. And last I heard, that, they're that... they're they're going back to look for it. So. Mm. Yeah. I'll be curious to see it's what the, the last that. the last we heard was that the scientist said it's glacial. Yeah, well Sharon, Sorry. didn't you look at that? You looked up the history yeah. of the region and yeah. it was in a a, a spot yep. that looked like a deposit. Yep, it was definitely glacial. And then when you draw a picture of the Millennium Falcon around it, Eve, right? It, it looks <laughs> like the Millennium Falcon. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Like everything else. Yeah, if you draw a picture of something, then it looks like what you've drawn a picture of. Yeah, especially with sonar. You know how that works. Yeah. Sonar it works really right. well for stuff right. like that. Yeah. Draw it with sound first, and then you could draw the picture around it. So I saw a really cool picture of Bigfoot on your website earlier this week. And I think you're going to talk about that. Uh. I don't, the, the the cute little cartoon. Yeah, the cute was, little cartoon. Yeah, I love that. I like the cartoons of Bigfoot. They're nice I, and friendly. I have a, a stock set of Bigfoot photos that I would use for um, putting up for for stories. You know, Bigfoot Crossing mm -hmm. or the Patterson Gimlin uh, little icon iconic vision of Bigfoot. But this one was just like um, this teacher in uh, Boise, Idaho. Was it was a science class, and it's from uh, it's, it's the Riverstone International School, which strikes me as maybe just you know one of those mm. schools where it's more advanced, kids are more advanced, and they do more interesting things in your everyday school curriculum. Well, this professor John Pedersen was a is a science teacher, and he's teaching the kids about ecology and quote scientific possibilities and he has a classroom full of taxidermied animal heads, animal parts, which in itself is kind of creepy because I know when my kids see like moose heads and, and bear heads and, and uh, taxidermied uh, hogs and or, uh, wild boars and stuff like that, they feel very, it's very, it's very creepy to see this, these stuffed animals there in, 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 a, in a real life environment because they should be real. They're dead and I don't know how he uses them uh, he says he uses them for forensic, wildlife forensics, which is interesting, but it's a taxidermy specimen that doesn't represent really the, the real creature. But anyway, he's also got a seven-foot-tall Sasquatch uh, taxidermy thing in his classroom. And it says, uh, the article says, the video says that he uses it to teach about ecology. 
and um, about science. Well, this kind of upset me because you can teach about ecology, that's terrific. Uh, how about we use animals that actually exist? And what struck me about this story was that he was using it, Bigfoot, as a, in a suggestive way to say that, uh, well, let's look at ecology, ecological principles using Bigfoot. What does he eat? Where does he live? We don't know those things. Um, we are bagels. I, yeah, I, I don't see that as a good use of uh, uh, an analogy in science. And I don't know, Ben, you, you took the same courses that I did for master's degree. We talked about using analogies in science. They can be dangerous to do this because you, you take a real world concept and you make it into a pretty story and you you, ha you have the possibility of misconstruing the story or, or just making people misunderstand the concept entirely or putting, putting nuances in there that don't belong. And I felt that this was a way that he was doing that by suggesting that Bigfoot was potentially real. Well, anyway, after the story aired on the local Idaho news station, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who is a professor in Idaho, I'm not sure which Idaho university it is, but one of the state universities in, in Idaho, and provided the teacher with some, uh, at least one cast, a footprint cast, in order to uh, educate the students on Bigfoot. So again, I just get this feeling that it's not about science, it's about belief in, in this creature, and making the kids more uh, open to the idea that Bigfoot is 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 existing in, in a way that doesn't really belong in a science class. Uh, so I posted up on my Facebook page that this story disturbed me, that it was being taught in a science class, and am I overreacting? And I got about, oh, I don't know, 40 comments, 40, 50 comments on it, and oddly enough, all the people who were sympathetic to Bigfoot existing said, no, it's not a problem. And the skeptic says, this is really a problem. Uh, it's not the way science should be taught. Of course, I, I go back to Barb Drescher who says science is not about probabilities, or it's not about possibilities, it's about probabilities. And the probability that Bigfoot is there is something that should be taught, not the possibility that Bigfoot is out there. That's the mistaken concept of, of educating about how science works. And um, I thought the same thing. I, I, I thought that this was, this was not, this is not a way to go about introducing monsters in the classroom. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I am a big fan of talking to kids about monsters because they're interested in the topic and you could you could talk about a lot of different subject areas when you talk about monsters in the classroom uh, including science how to how to approach the science and how to approach evidence and critical thinking and how to evaluate these claims this did not appear to be what the teacher was doing and they interviewed a student and the student came right out and says well yeah we learned about how Bigfoot could exist in this sort of environment and stuff like that so right right off the bat I'm thinking this is just a not not a good way to be teaching about science uh, in, in by using Bigfoot as an analogy so uh, yeah I felt uncomfortable about it if it was my kids classroom you'd bet I'd be in that classroom giving the skeptical view but I actually once tried to talk about monsters in my uh, daughter's classroom, fourth grade classroom, for, mm -hmm. third grade classroom, and they told me, no, you're not allowed because it suggests belief, and if you talk about belief, then it could lead to other uncomfortable conversations about religion. So I was told, don't come. Hmm. So. This 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 whole idea of of this concept in the classroom bothers me. I don't think it's a good way to teach science at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I was gonna say I think that that's that's you know I think I'm more or less on the same page with Sharon. I mean, if you're to my mind, it's very much you know on the number of angels dancing on the head of a pin. I mean, if if it's real, then what does it eat? And you know, we've all seen this over and over. Like, well, people people go on and on. They write entire books and do interviews talking about what Bigfoot does. Where do they sleep? I know where they sleep. I know what they eat. I I know what their social patterns are. I'm like, what the hell do you, you you? This is all speculation. As long as it's framed as speculation, then that's fine. But, you know, my guess is that it was not framed as speculation. It was like, hey, guys, you know, Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Bigfoot. And it might not be there, but Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's really touchy because it's a great subject to talk about, and you can teach a lot of concepts with it. But 
it's just a slippery slope and if you really do end up making this an advocacy story for Bigfoot and putting an I yeah. easily putting the idea yeah. in kids heads that Teach it has the cr controversy yeah <laughs> right, right. yeah I, I have my t-shirt it's not only got Bigfoot but it's, it's got the, it's got the Loch Ness monster it's got the Jersey Devil you know, you gotta teach the yeah, controversy like if you're gonna teach I have that things. shirt, I love it. Yeah, I, I, love that shirt. I have the aliens building the pyramids one. So. Yeah, yeah. A really well, quick there's a question on in the comments. Uh, a guy named Sam Basta. I know Sam. Mm -hmm. Hi Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Any more news about the Altoona Bigfoot? Yes, I have news about Ooh. the Altoona Bigfoot. <laughs> I have listened to the police tapes and uh, there is no mention of a shooting, but there was mention to take the call off air. <laughs> so um, the call that was taken was was not broadcast uh, on the air, but there is a address I think associated with it that I that I picked out, and um, Can still you give a quick background in case people don't know what we're talking about. Last night, somebody put on a forum or or blogs or someplace that they had heard that a, a turkey hunter had shot a bigfoot in central Pennsylvania around Altoona. And subsequent to that, then there was the police reports or the police scanner uh, uh, tapes that came out. And in one tape, they you could hear that they were called to a home. And I can't make out the the garbled uh, talk. I'm I, I'm not up on my police lingo, so I'm not really sure what they're talking about. But on the other tape, it does say um, to call the game commission. Somebody claims that they have proof of Bigfoot. And I haven't heard anything followed up on that. I'm in contact with Eric Altman of the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society, who is investigating, and he's going to check it out. So I'm going to wait to see what he says about that. Very cool. I'm not. I don't have my hopes up high. But but probably Bigfoot. This stuff. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> or a very large hairy turkey with large feet. Could be. Yeah, uh, Cambria County is very wooded, and it's got a lot of weird things going on there. And Bigfoot is well known in that area. He was elected to high office. <laughs> Could have been. Apparently, he's the mayor. Okay, we've got. Uh, see, we've got a good twenty minutes left because we started late, and I was going to give Ben some time to talk about a couple of the stories he recently posted on uh, Discovery News. You've got some cute up there, Ben. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about. Um, actually, was inspired by some something I saw on Doubtful News on on Sharon's piece on on zombies. Yeah, Sharon. Yeah. Uh, where uh, which I always I always just love Doubtful News. I, I enjoy getting the little updates and and it's cool because it's sort of a give and take. Sometimes I find great ideas for stuff, and then sometimes I, I I'm surprised to find myself on there. I'm like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> uh, but but she had an interesting piece uh, on on uh, on a guy in um, in Zimbabwe who um, getting a lot of who, stories out of weird stories out of Zimbabwe. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, yeah, Zimbabwe. Are they stealing penises yeah. again? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. Uh, I, if they could depose that uh, that uh, piece of shit, uh, Robert Mugabe, Mugabe. That'd be happy with that. Yeah. Sorry, getting into African politics. Anyway, um, but yes, there's a, there's a guy, um, a guy, a 34 year old guy named Brighton, which is a little odd. But uh, apparently, Brighton uh, died. It didn't say how, but he, he uh, people were at his funeral, and all of a sudden they're like, "Hey, his leg is twitching," and he came back to life. And well, you know, obviously wasn't dead in the first place. Um, but uh, he was Sharon only a, mostly dead. <laughs> mostly <laughs> only dead. He was like two thirds, you know, a little, little fuzzy. Yes, and you um, go back. <laughs> I'm not that dead. Right. I'm not there yet. Come back. <laughs> but uh, no, it was it was it was fascinating. But it, oh. it struck me that that you know Sharon made a really good point, which is that this is not that uncommon. And and it's it's in in many ways this sort of ties it in with like near death experience. And, uh, and and some of these other sort of paranormal claims where I think in our everyday lives it's easy to sort of think of the, the line between life and death as being very clear and very precise. It's like, well, he's either alive or he's dead. Yeah. No, there's variations. You know, comatose people are they're alive, but there's certainly there, there's, there's, there's gray areas there, and there are certain people who who uh, who are not you know living and functioning, but but they're nonetheless still have baseline. 
uh, borderline, uh, you know, pulse and, and other vital signs. And, and so it occurred to me that that might be an interesting piece. And so I did a, a piece, uh, article on uh, on Discovery News uh, today where I was just basically talked a little bit about that. And uh, and of course, for me, it sort of ties back in with with the uh, the, the the fear of premature burial. Uh, you know, for 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 millennia, people have been terrified that they're going to accidentally be buried alive. In fact, there's a really good by really good book by Jen Bodenson uh, that I quote in the piece, um, and he it's called Buried Alive, and it's just a fascinating examination of the history of the fear of being buried alive and and what the steps that people would take uh, to do that. Um, anyway, so that that sort of just um, that that sort of launched my uh, the, the the premise for that, and, and again looking at the you know the different ways of you know, at one point people would take needles and poke them in the eye in the eyeballs and just Ooh. yeah, sort of. <sighs> but I mean, these stories where these people are maybe they have really really low blood pressure, their heart is barely beating, they're they're barely breathing, but they're still alive. You can imagine that some people really were buried alive. Uh, absolutely, and um, it's, it's terrifying. Um, in this country, um, I, I mean, we we have we put them in the morgue, and there, there's also some stories not in this country about people waking up in the morgue. Yeah, as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Creepy. Romeo and Juliet. There but, we go. Uh, so okay. these these other countries don't do the extensive embalming and and stuff that we do here or well that that's exactly and that that was actually that's how I ended my piece was talking about how uh, it, it's sort of ironic you know people talk about how doctors bury their mistakes and um, and you know as as Sharon pointed out. It, the process of embalming pretty much ensures they're dead. <laughs> At the point in which you're taking out their blood and you're putting in embalming fluid, you got that covered. Dead. You don't need yeah. to worry about that and coming back. That's yeah. that's pretty well nailed at that point. Um, whereas in other countries, uh, a lot of places, they, the bomb embalming isn't done either just because they can't afford it or it's just not traditional to their, their local customers. I see. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of, a, kind of a fun way to do that. Yuck. So not a zombie again. No, no, sadly not. So sad. <laughs> and why are they always waking up at the services? They don't want to it's miss more, their own funeral. It's, it's more dramatic that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm thinking. Well, or maybe, you know what? It could be that they have a quicker turnaround time than we have. We usually wait for a few days before we do a burial. A lot of cultures, they bury the bodies very quickly. So maybe mm -hmm. they just haven't been down that long. Well, the week before, there was a story about the, the hooker. Oh, what? Up. I'm sorry? Hooker? <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so there, everybody stop. Bob's interested. In what? Hold on. Yes? She, she died during work hours. And <laughs> <laughs> work hours? I like yeah. the way that's phrased. Very nicely phrased. <laughs> and they removed her. And I forget what country this was. They removed her. Oddly, and not in a body bag, but in a steel coffin, which I thought was strange. I, so I, I'm not buying this story, which is why I didn't cover it on, on Doubtful News. It was too doubtful. But um, could have been completely made up. But apparently she just burst out of the coffin and said, ah! I started screaming. Yeah. What are you trying to so, do? Are you trying to kill me? Where's my money? Yeah, I can see that. That would oh. be very, very awkward. I've not been paid, damn it. <laughs> No, actually, well, it was it's all funny, Bob, to bring that up. There, in the uh, in in the 1700s, in late 1700s, in in France, actually, people were so concerned about it, they would have what were called waiting mortuaries, and they would actually take the dead there. They would line them up in these basically warehouses, and they because they were so concerned about burying uh, people who were actually alive. So there would be these attendants who would just basically walk back and forth. Among uh, these these rows of corpses and various poking it with the poking, sticks, just poking them with sticks, poking and you know, and, and just just uh, looking for any any sign of decomposition. Um, I can't imagine. I imagine that the turnover rate in that job was probably pretty pretty high. But um, the official stick poker. I'll poke you good. Uh, by the way, if, it, if anyone likes uh, good horror movies of people being buried alive, there's a there's a uh, film called The Vanishing by George Slizier. See the original. Don't see the don't see the shitty remake with uh, Kiefer Sutherland. I think it was. That's the one I've seen. Um, hmm? Yeah, don't see I've that. Seen, I've see seen the, the horrible remake. Yeah. See see the original. It's very good. 
Okay. That's my right. that's my movie recommendation for the awesome. Movie. So we have no zombies, but but decent movie recommendations. Awesome. Uh, let's see, we got uh, we can probably start uh, doing announcements. Uh, I think Sharon's got an announcement. Oh yes, I just announced that um, I'm going to be doing a, a workshop at the uh, James Randi Educational Foundation in Hollywood. The end of May. It will be June second, actually. I'm going there. That the is the end of May. Yeah, June second, <laughs> Sunday. Very, very, very late May. Um, <laughs> it's like negative May. Plus or minus. Yeah. Yeah. Error it's bars. within the margin of error. It's in the <laughs> error bars there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And uh, so they're gonna be, take you. They're gonna take you to the Magic Castle. Uh, I I don't know yet. But, oh, um, they have to. We'll see. Uh, I. Uh, uh, I'll be uh, we'll be videotaping the presentation about uh, it's called I doubt that the media guide to skepticism so hopefully we'll have people come out and, and see that live and then it will also go on the net as a video workshop Very cool. awesome nice. so, and I also had a uh, a post out last week on the Huffington Post that went went around quite a bit. It was about hoaxing. I, it was my second in part of hoaxing. The first one I had talked about the three hoaxes we had in one week. You know the alien, the 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 uh, lock, the lake monster, the Irish lake monster hoax, and I don't know, probably oh Bigfoot, Rick Dyer's Bigfoot body. <laughs> He's the poster <laughs> boy for Bigfoot hoax of the year. Yeah. Um, and then uh, then I followed that up with talking to Jeb Card about uh, this really cool word called a culture. O C C U L T U R E. Like a cult culture. I thought it was one of the greatest words I'd ever heard about the culture of the occult and uh, how hoaxing has always been part of that. So we had a nice discussion, and that's up on Huffington Post. Awesome. Cool. Anybody else have anything? Because I don't have anything on my list here. Um, and... I think next week I'm on Strange Frequencies Radio. <gasps> yes, nice. you are. Very yep. nice. I'll be listening. I, I recommended you to them. You're oh, welcome. Oh, thank you. And you will have a great time. Ben has been on before. Yep. Those guys are awesome. I always yeah, have a good time fun. with them. Yep. Fun. <clears throat> what, what, what's your topic? If, well, if we I may think ask. We're, we may be wide ranging. We're, we, we'll do conspiracy probably and probably Br Brzezinski as well. And feel free to swear you're allowed. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I didn't swear just now, but. I wanted to. <laughs> no, no I swear there, not not here. Yes. Okay. Now that that's clear. Um, I think it's book time. Everybody got books? Mm -hmm. Yes. You brought, you brought book, Ben? Would you like? I do. Sure, I'll go first. Um, thank you. Wondering this. if you're gonna do. Okay. <laughs> wondering if I'm gonna pull it off? Yes, I am. Um, my book is uh, is a no, book. No, don't tell us. Don't tell us. Don't tell us. No, don't tell no, us. No, 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 no. You read first. We we'll go back through. Uh, I, 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 I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm gonna. My my French is non-existent, but I will. That, uh, that that's actually not gonna give away. That'll be fun. Okay. <clears throat> Subscription figures do not begin to convey the impact of the reporting of the Courier de Avilon and other papers like it. A single issue of any major newspaper reached many readers in the 1760s, not only because of, of sharing among family and friends. The sudden increase in book and newspaper publishing in the middle decades of the 18th century brought with it an expanding infrastructure that assured, that assured wide dissemination of the printed word. Some booksellers lent news sheets on site for a small fee. Others sold outdated issues at a discounted rate. For readers who could not afford the cost of a... Readers who could not afford the cost of a new newspaper subscription or who wished to combine reading with socializing, reading rooms offered another attractive venue for news consumption. Who's up next? Go, Sharon. Paranormal, paranormal proponents tend to see themselves as researchers or investigators and view paranormal research as a frontier scientific discipline. They are the contemporary counterparts of those early preternatural proponents examined in the previous chapter who also framed their interest as being, quote, scientific. 
of all the paranormal proponents involved in the paranormal debate, it is the scientifically oriented ones who are perhaps the least critical of orthodox scientific methods, seeking not to overthrow science but to supplement scientific inquiry with their own paranormal research. Bob? Since the beginnings of the study of rhetoric, which was synonymous with persuasion until the early 20th century, theorists and practitioners have been concerned with ethics. The form of government in ancient Greece, ancient Greece encouraged public speaking. Citizens voiced their opinions openly and were encouraged to share in making political and judicial decisions. Because civic responsibility was presumed, encouragement to be honorable citizens and to acquire skill in public statement was strong. The Athenian system disqualified disqualified any speaker who was, quote, suspected of certain dishonorable acts. He could be prosecuted not for the offense, but for continuing to speak in the assembly after committing the offense. People studied the art of rhetoric almost his entire system of higher education, if not a way of life. Hmm. Eve. Curitan went straight into the living room and saw Thorod and the other dead people sitting by the fire, as usual. Oh, right. Next, Curtin summons Thor Woodleg, and Thor Cat summons Thorod for trespassing on the home and robbing people of life and health. All the dead ones at the fire were summoned in the same way. Then the door court was held and charges made, the proper procedure of ordinary law courts being observed throughout. The jury was appointed, testimony was taken, and the cases were, summoned, were summed up and referred for judgment. A sentence was being passed on Thor Woodleg. He rose to his feet. I sat here as long as people would let me, he said. And then he went out through the other door where the court was not being held. After that, sentence was passed on the shepherd, and he stood up. I'll go now, he said, and it seems to me I should have gone sooner. When Thor Grima Witchface heard her sentence, she stood up too. I stayed as long as you let me. So they all were sentenced, one after another, and as they were sentenced, they got up, made some such remark, and left the room. It was clear that none of them wanted to go. I'm going to start mm. calling somebody Witchface now. Witchface. <laughs> uh, Witchface. Witch <laughs> the present day Christian claim that certain people can heal the affected, the afflicted by laying of hands originated in 19th century American America. Uh, and in, in European evangelists. You know, I didn't read that correctly at all. Uh, the Reverend William Brown, Branham, Branham, a former game warden from Jeffersonville, Indiana, is often credited with bringing the modern evangelical fundamentalist healing movement into the existence in the 1940s. Pastor Branham was a fire and brimstone Bible thumper who offered his audience spectacular performances and grand promises. He also was quick to blame his victims for their failures. In June 1947, in the town of Vandela, Vand Vandelia, Illinois, Vandalia. Place in Illinois, yeah, Vandalia, he apparently had cured Walter Beck, a deaf mute. When he heard the next day that Beck's condition was bad, it was as bad as ever. Branham replied, "I hear that Walker has smoked a cigarette after I told him he would have he would have to give them up." Because of this, he will not be able to hear or talk, and in all probability, he will be afflicted with some greater trouble, perhaps cancer. Tobacco seemed an, <laughs> tobacco seemed an unlikely cause for Beck's deaf mute condition since he had been born in that state. Brandon was so convinced, convincing a preacher that, he, that when he died in, in 1965, uh, when, in, when he died in a 1965 automobile accident, he wasn't buried, buried for four months because his flock expected him to ride from the dead. He wasn't buried for four months because his flock expected him to rise from the dead at Easter. Ew. <laughs> oh. Oh. Wah, wah, Nasty. Wah, wah. <laughs> what's, your, uh, what's your book, Ben? My book is called Monsters of the Jivedon, The Making of a Beast. It's a... Huh? Uh, it is an excellent, I, I would consider it the best, uh, the best book ever written on the cryptozoological mystery, uh, The Beast of Gévedon, for those uh, who are interested in that. It's, uh, it's this, it's, it's, depending on who you talk to, it is the, the Beast of the Gévedon was either a werewolf or a hyena or a serial killer or whatever the hell you want to think it was. Um, but uh, it's, it was something that killed a bunch of peasants in, in, in 17th century France, in, in the southern part of France. And Who it's been didn't enduring kill a mystery. bunch of peasants? 
<laughs> there, you go. there you go. Good point. Well done. Um, but yes, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a very good. Uh, it's a, it's one of the better uh, books in terms of looking at a at a historical mystery uh, from a from a cryptozoological and good skeptical point of view. It's a great history book. I mean, even if you're not interested in monsters, it's a great history yes, book. Yes, absolutely. Nice, Sharon. Um, mine is The Paranormal and the Politics of Truth, a sociological account by Jeremy Northcote. It's a British publication, so it's a little bit expensive in the U.S., but I, I wrote one blog post on it, and I'm going to probably write some more because it, it really resonates with the research that I had done about why people uh, are drawn to the paranormal studies. really liked it. Nice. Bob? I have Jowett and O'Donnell's... Uh, Propaganda and Persuasion. Mm, nice cover. Mm, yep. <laughs> yeah, she's with the over, over here and pointing right <laughs> here where you can see. Can see oh, I can look up yeah. his nose. Oh, oh, I, I see it right there. I can see it right there. Yeah. Please don't point. Thank you. <laughs> Eve? Air Big Yasaga, translated by Herman Pelson and Paul Edwards. Awesome names. Mm -hmm. Which face? Which face? Yeah. We're going to be using which face for a long time. There's, Mine of course, was... in Cod Biter, too. A Cod Biter? Awesome. <laughs> a Cod Pea Spider? What? Cod Biter. That means something completely different. Mine <laughs> is a classic. It is uh, Faith Hillers from James Randi. Oh. oh and it's one of go. my favorites because I've actually got experience in that kind of realm. So. Have, have you healed? You've risen from the dead. I have. I have hands speak, on spoken in tongues and laid hands on people. So, not for fun. Wow. And on that note, I guess that's time to wrap up. Anybody want to add anything real quick? You got a couple of minutes. Actually, got one minute. Uh, really quick. I, I, will, I will. I will fill in twenty seconds of that. Uh, part of the reason that I chose that that passage to read is because uh, it, it reminded me of the, the, so the, show, the social media aspect of some of these monsters, and there's lots of really interesting parallels with how the, the chupacabra emerged and was perpetuated through the media and through the Internet. And in very much the same way, the Beast of Givadon was also perpetuated um, through, through newspapers of the day. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And now it's the time we dance. <laughs> Virtual Skeptics is an independent production of Doubtful News, What's the Harm.net, Skeptical Humanities, and myself. Our logo was designed by Sarah Mayhew at sarahmayhew.com, and our theme music is by Tremor and used with permission. Thanks, everybody, for watching.